There's something about edges that love life. The bay's literal edge of land and water alone covers thousands of miles, but the true edges of the Chesapeake are so much more diverse and abundant than that. They extend to those joints and intersections and overlaps and seams where land joins water, forest borders field, where fields fall off to beaches and marshes, marshes to shallows, shallows to deep channels. They can extend to the edges of cold fronts and warm fronts, the edges of the seasons coming and going, along which great migrations of critters from eels to blue crabs to swans and loons and ospreys and eagles, uh, shad and herring all occur. The edge is literally boundless. Here are a few voices from those diverse and abundant edges. I know shorelines around the Chesapeake, but I could live as a hunter-gatherer. You could still live in these areas and subsist off of what nature provides you. All you have to do is go out on the mudflats and there's your dinner laid out for you. Now, my name's Darren Lowry. I study the uh, geology and the archaeology of the Chesapeake Bay. Primarily, I focus my efforts along um, uh, shorelines in areas that are eroded because you can see the geology. You can see how there's a story and a history and a, a documentation of how the landscape has changed. And also you can see the human record uh, along shorelines. The Shellmans represent a combination of long-term human interest in the shoreline areas and the coastal areas. Uh, and you can see that on the eastern shore by the numerous sites that represent, in some cases, thousands of years of humans living and uh, exploiting shellfish at one location. I'm in a riparian forest in a bald cypress dominated swamp where there's beautiful large trees. The largest are the bald cypress, but there's beautiful red maples, black gum, sweet gum, holly. It's a perfect fall day. My name is Joan Maloof. I'm working on a project to create an old growth forest network. What makes the James Branch special today, so special, is that it's one of the last places left where we can see trees that are of the type that would have been here 500 years ago. Someone cored one of the trees 20 years ago and at that time discovered that it was 540 years old. That tree was still a young tree, but a good sized young tree when John Smith first came up and explored the area. Think of all the changes that have happened between then and now, and that exact tree is still standing. It's over 100 feet tall. It's, uh, take about, I guess, four of my shoulder widths to go one way across it, and reaches up through the canopy. It's taller than any of the other trees around here. If you were a bird flying over, this definitely might be a place where you'd stop for a rest. The major problem in the Chesapeake Bay is too many nutrients. It's only the forests that are going to take water coming into the bay and remove those nutrients before they reach the bay. James Branch is a little woodland stream, but that does run into the Nanticoke River that runs into the Chesapeake Bay. And so that's really where the bay starts. So if we can clean up the water at the very tips of the watershed, at the edges of the capillaries, if you will, then the whole bay will be cleaner. We don't want a clean bay just because it means that we can eat oysters and crabs out of it. This place is a habitat for so many different species 
and we need to keep reminding ourselves that we are not the most important species. We want to keep older forests because there are animals and fungi and plants that need the older forest to survive. If we reduce that habitat, we've reduced the number of those species, and some of them, sadly, we have reduced to extinction. My name is James Eskridge. I, I, everybody calls me Ukra, that's my nickname. And uh, I'm the mayor of Tangier Island. But before I'm uh, mayor, I'm a commercial waterman. Uh, catch soft crabs and eels and oysters on the Chesapeake Bay. Summertime, I work in shallow water and uh, up, up between Tangier and Smith Islands. Uh, I'm after the blue crab. But it's uh, pillar is a blue crab that's getting ready to molt or shed. I use pillar pots and you don't want to get right in the grass. So you usually get on the edge of the grass beds. It's usually good and sometimes on the edge of deep water. And we bring them into the crab shanties and put them in tanks. And once they're soft, we ship them to New York and they bring good money. I've always Paid attention to the birds and the waterfowl when they're migrating. Uh, springtime, I always keep a check on when the first osprey show up and the laughing girl and pelicans. Then in the fall, uh, I notice when they start to leave. Even the monarch butterflies as they come through. I love what I'm doing and uh, I just look around a lot and take notice of my surroundings. A lot of guys don't do that, they miss out they go out and they couldn't tell you what, what's been around them all day or anything else. My son goes on to me sometimes, he says, you know, Dad, you, you're taking too much time out. You stop, you stop what you're doing and you're looking at clouds or birds or butterflies and that makes the job that much better to me. One thing about forests is just the remarkable beauty. So as we sit here today in this wetland forest, it is so lovely and it just gives a lift to my heart and my spirit that if I were sitting on a curb somewhere in town, it would feel completely differently. So does that beauty have a value to us? It's hard to put a finger on it dollar-wise economically, but I think we need to recognize that beauty is important and it should hold a place in our decisions for now and for the future.